Jedras tako i vino. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Assalamu alaikum dear participants. Welcome to this session of textual study of the Quran. Uh, today we will start off uh, with verse 243 of Surah Baqarah. And from here actually uh, you would realize that uh, this is uh, the last section of the Surah. And it is in this section that the Surah uh, reach, reaches its culmination. And uh, the, it's actually the fourth section. The, the last section is the conclusion uh, which will follow this fourth section. And uh, in it, the topic of jihad and infaq is brought to a completion which could not be completed in the previous section because of some on-the-spot questions that had been raised and they were answered. So we will find this uh, reaching its completion and uh, then we will look at some of the more important uh, details uh, that uh, arise as we study these verses. So let's start off. Alam tara ila lazina kharaju min diyarihim wa hum ulufun hadar al maut faqala Allahu Allahu mutu summa ahyahum inna Allaha lazu fadlin ala nas walakin akthar an nasi la yashkurun These issues had arisen because of your questions about jihad and infaq believers their directives should not weigh heavily upon you did you not see the people who were in thousands and who fled their homes because of the fear of death at this, God said to them, live like the dead. They remain in this state for years. Then God brought them back to life again. Surely God is gracious to people, but most among people are not grateful to him. So the first thing that uh, might uh, strike you is the nature of the address. You can see it starts off with Alam Tara, and this is a singular address. But uh, when the Quran addresses plural entities in this singular way, the purpose is to uh, address each and every uh, addressee in an individual way. So the word alam tara, uh, although it might seem to be you to be a singular address, in essence it is a plural address. The uh, part of history which is related here uh, has to be understood in its background. And uh, as far as the incident which is described here is concerned, it relates to the Philistines who had attacked the Israelites and had massacred them and took away the ark from them which held the status of a Qibla. We know that the Ark uh, which they had, uh, had the status of the Qibla, and they used to pray uh, by pointing towards and facing towards that Ark. So the Bible actually describes this incident in which they, the Philistines had fought uh, the Israelites. Uh, remember, the Israelites were in, uh, in, in the land of Canaan, and the Philistines had fought them. And the way this is mentioned in the Bible, I'm just going to uh, read out the uh, excerpt. So it says, so the Philistines fought, and Israelites were defeated, and every man fled to his tent. The slaughter was very great. Israelite, the Is Israel lost 30,000 foot soldiers. The Ark of God was captured. So the details of this incident, as described in the 7th and 11th chapters of the first book of Samuel, actually show that although the Israelites were 300,000, so they were 300,000 in number, uh, they were not able to face the Philistines because they were morally weak and were in a state of political turmoil and discord. They were forced to vacate this, their cities from Ekron to Goth. So this, these are areas that they had to vacate because of this attack of the Philistines. And uh, it is known that uh, from the Bible, as we, can, uh, we shall see, that this uh, whole era actually lasted for, for about 20, uh, for about 30, 20 years, uh, uh, as the Bible is say. But before we go on to the, the uh, how the Bible describes uh, the extent of this era, we need to understand the word mutu. So the word which is in the imperative form says die. And this word actually just describes the humiliation of the Israelites as a nation. When it is, God says mutu, die, it doesn't mean that physical death that we often know of. The law of the Almighty regarding the progeny of Abraham is that they would be punished in this world for their crimes. So when instead of being steadfast on their faith and doing pious deeds, they, if they cling to moral, uh, immoral practices and they are uh, covered and they uh, violate the covenant with the Almighty, uh, the Almighty then inflicts on them humiliation and disgrace. And uh, uh, as I said that in the, in the first book of Samuel, the Israelites faced the situation for 20 years. So the Bible says, it was a long time uh, it was a long time, 20 years in all, 
that the ark remained in Kiriath Jearim, and all the people of Israel mourned and sought after the Lord. So this was something uh, which is clearly, uh, clearly a very big loss for them. And uh, as you can see, the Quran then says uh, after that, فَقَالَ لَهُمُ اللَّهُ مُوتُ So we will study the, those verses and see how uh, the Almighty actually then gave them uh, that, that, that uh, life once again. So going back to the translation, so it says, فَقَالَ لَهُمُ اللَّهُ مُوتُ ثُمَّ أَحْيَاهُمْ so, as I said, this death, which is uh, called here, is not the death that we face uh, in a physical form, but it's like that um, morally decrupt strait that they were facing. And then it uh, says, Summa So, this was like being given new life. And this new life was given to them in accordance with the law referred to earlier, which relates to Abraham's progeny. So, when the Israelites repented and once again professed faith, the Almighty rewarded them by reviving in them reviving them in the collective capacity and granting them honor and, and uh, domination over their enemies. And the Bible actually records this detail as well. So referring to the Bible, it says, So Samuel said to all the Israelites, If you are returning to the Lord with, your, with all your heart, hearts and then rid yourselves of the foreign gods and the Ashtoreths and commit yourselves to the Lord and serve him only, and he will deliver you out of the hand of the Philistines. So the Israelites put away their balls and ashtoreths and served the Lord only. So as you can see that they had become incriminated with, with various forms of uh, polytheism and they had taken to policy polytheism. But uh, when, once they repented, uh, the Almighty once again restored their dominance. And the Philistines were subdued and did not invade the, invade the Israelite uh, uh, territory once again. And throughout the prophet Samuel's lifetime, the hand of God, was uh, against the Philistines, and that we, and we can see that the various towns uh, they were they were given to them, and uh, it's recorded in the first book of Samuel, chapter seven, uh, verses thirteen to fourteen. Uh, it says, "So the Philistines were subdued and did not invade the Israelite territory again. Throughout Samuel's lifetime, the hand of Lord was against the Philistines." The towns from Ekron to Gath that the Philistines had captured from Israel were restored to her, and Israel delivered the neighboring territory from the power of the Philistines. So you can see how in the times of the, of the prophet Samuel, uh, this was once again given back to them. So now moving, moving on to the next verse, it says, وَقَاتِلُوا فِي سَبِيلِ اللَّهِ وَعْلَمُوا أَنَّ اللَّهَ سَمِيعٌ عَلِيمٌ Believers, learn a lesson from this. And wage war for the cause of God, and fully bear in mind that God hears all and knows all. Who is it that will give? So that is the next verse. Believers learn a lesson from this. So basically, what has happened here is that uh, Ishmaelites, who in those times had uh, been given this responsibility, they are reminded uh, of the history of the Israelites, and they have, they are told that look, you drive inspiration from those Israelites who, once they were subdued, had regained that uh, the lost territory because they had repented. So now they are being told that if you fight uh, for the cause of God. Uh, be inspired uh, from them. And for this purpose, this is something which the Quran offers, often says, that hasana, that for the purpose of jihad, you lend a goodly loan to God, which means that you spend for the cause of God for this war that is at stake. And in accordance with his promise, with the progeny of uh, Abraham, God will bless them and grant them sovereignty and success. And these verses also actually sound a warning that if the Ishmaelites now fear death and, pre and prefer humiliation and disgrace for themselves, they will once again face this death in accordance with the same promise. So it was essential for them that they realize that as far as uh, the Quran is concerned, they must not uh, be any, uh, I mean, the Quran has given them this clear lesson that they should not in any way uh, uh, turn, turn their backs and they should draw inspiration uh, in, to what had happened to Israel. So they were outnumbered. They were in the state of uh, spiritual death for 20 years, but then they repented. And once again, God, they found favor with God. So it's like uh, making them look at their predecessors and, uh, be, and, and learn and draw a lesson from their history. Alam tara ilil mala imim bani Israel amim ba'di Musa iz qalu lil nabiyin lahum 
Did you not see the leaders of the Israelites after Moses when they asked a prophet of theirs, appoint a king for us so that at his bidding we can wage war for the cause of God? So this is the, the same incident which was, uh, uh, I mean, uh, referred to earlier on in a very brief way. And uh, now it is, uh, it is being said in a very detailed way. And the Bible points out that the prophet here, the word here is, uh, says Nabi, that their Nabi was Samuel. And Samuel, to, they, they asked Samuel that they should be given a king, they should be uh, appointed a king over themselves, someone should be appointed a king amongst themselves, over themselves, so that this would be something uh, which, would, which might make them uh, dominate the rest of the world or the rest of the, the people around them. So, uh, since the incident here has been discussed from another angle, it has not been mentioned that the Almighty did not approve of the demand from the Israelites that a king be appointed over them. But it is evident from the Bible that the Almighty did not approve of this and asked them to not put on the yoke of slavery from their own hands. So basically, these people were the ones who had asked their own prophet that a king should be appointed. And uh, although the Quran does not describe uh, God's displeasure, but we know from the Bible that God actually, uh, actually discouraged them and said that, well, if someone is appointed as a king, you'll become his slaves. And uh, he'll ask you to do all sorts of things that relate to servitude, and then you'll regret. But they insisted. So this particular aspect is, is mentioned in, in the Bible. Uh, and let me just uh, read some parts of that uh, excerpt. So it's from Samuel 1 and chapter number 8, verses 6 to 20. But when they said, God, give us a king to lead us, this displeased Samuel. So he prayed to the Lord, and the Lord told him, listen to all that the people are saying to you. It is not you that they have rejected, but they have rejected me as their king. Samuel told all the words of the Lord to the people who were asking him for a king. So basically, at their demand, when they were asked for the king, God said, well, I am your king. I am there for you. And uh, they still wanted someone in human form to be appointed as their king. So this was what the king, uh, the king who will reign over you will do. He will take your sons and make them serve with his chariots and horses. So all that Samuel is now telling them. That if you insist on that a king be appointed over you, then you will be really uh, regret. You'll really regret what has happened because he is going to really put you to task. And they will run in front of his chariots. Some he will assign to be commanders in thousands and com of thousands and commanders of fifties, and others to plow his ground and reap his harvest, and still others to make weapons of war and equipment of his for his chariots. He will take your daughters to be perfumers and cooks and bakers. So. The, son would be, the sons would be put in the charge of the army and the daughters would be appointed to make perfumes and they would be appointed as cooks and bakers. He will, he will take the best of your fields and vineyards and olive groves and give them to his attendants. So this is all the description that Samuel is telling them that if they insist on that a king be appointed over them, then this is how things will take shape. He will take a tenth of your grain and of your vintage and give it to his officials and attendants, your men servants and maid servants, and the best of your cattle and donkeys he will take for his own use. He will take a tenth of your flocks, and you yourselves will become his slaves. When the day comes, you will cry out for relief from the king you have chosen, and the Lord will not answer you in that day. But the people refused to listen to Samuel. So this is the important thing, that in spite of this big speech that Samuel made uh, before them, that they should not uh, they should not go for a king, and they, he described how they will humiliate their own sons and their daughters. They still insisted. So, no, they said, we want a king over us. Then we will be like all other nations with a king to lead us and to go out before us and fight our battles. So, they insisted, and we know that uh, once they insisted, God actually, uh, I mean, this is like God giving way to them and said, okay, since this is your wish, and that shall be granted, and then you'll regret what you had actually wished for. So, وَقَالَ لَهُمْ نَبِيُّهُمْ إِنَّ اللَّهَ قَدْ بَعَسَ لَكُمْ قَالُوتَ مَلِكَ قَالُوا 
ان يكون له الملك علينا ونحن احق بالملك منه ولم يؤتى سعه من المال قال ان الله اصطفاه عليكم وزاده بسطه في العلم والجسم والله يؤتي ملكه من يشاء والله واسع عليم and at this demand of theirs their prophet told them god has appointed talut as your king so talut is the person which we know is uh, uh, called saul in the in, in the bible and probably talut is his uh, his is one of his uh, names uh, that the quran is uh, mentioned here so they replied how can he be made king upon us when we are more deserving of it than him and he is also not a rich person the prophet replied god has chosen him to rule over you and for this purpose blessed him with great wisdom and physique this is the kingdom of god and god gives this kingdom in accordance with his wisdom to whomsoever he he wills so you observe matters through your own narrow vision and god is munificent he knows everything so you can see how the almighty uh, has i mean discouraged them that he tried to his best but they did not listen to him and ultimately uh, saul uh, was appointed through samuel and uh, therefore they were they were called upon to serve him and once they were actually appointed he was appointed uh, he did not they did not like him because it is known that he that he actually uh, belonged to a tribe which was uh, i mean uh, inferior to their own tribe and uh, to the benjamin tribe to be precise and they were the tribe that uh, they did not like at all they, it was the he was someone who did not uh, uh, stand well with them but as far as uh, talut is concerned uh, we know that god blessed him with this physique and this his wisdom which is just referred to here and in the book of bible also you will find that uh, the his his description is not very different so it says in samuel 1 chapter number 10 verse 23 and as he stood among the people he was a head taller than any of the others so you see uh, this is how uh, they were told that if, as far as the objection is concerned it was it was it was like a habit that had become uh, so they had become so used to and as i said the reason for this was that talut was from the benjaminite tribe and among the israelite tribes this was the smallest and talut was from a family which was of the lowliest stature in this tribe moreover as is mentioned uh, as i've just said he was also not a rich person so the quran says that he was not a rich person and as you can see from the bible uh, once again the troublemakers said uh, how can this fellow save us they despised him and brought him no gifts but saul kept silent so saul is the same as talut saul is uh, the quran uh, speaking of uh, him as talut and in the bible is called saul as just, saul as i just said so basically they did not accept him when first they made this demand and when the almighty granted this demand and he appointed a, someone who was befitting uh, for this purpose he was he was well built he was tall he had this physique and in those tribal times having a tall physique uh, was a big qualification for being becoming a leader and quran says zadahu bastatan fil ilmi wal jism not only he had the physique he also had the knowledge and wisdom uh, through which he could govern them so this is how uh, the almighty has said that as far as the quran is concerned uh, it is absolutely uh, uh, evident that these were the things that they were required to do okay so it says wa qala lahum nabiyyuhum inna ayata mulkihi an ya'tiyakum at-tabut fihi sakinatu min rabbikum wa baqiyatu mimma taraka alu musa wa alu harun li tahmiluhu al-mala'ika inna fi zalika la ayatan lakum in kuntum mu'minin and their prophet further explained for them the portent portent means sign the portent of him being appointed king by god would be that your ark will come back to you from the hands of your enemies in which there were there always has remained for you great tranquility from your lord and in which there are relics which the progeny of moses and aaron have left behind for you it will be borne by the angels surely in it is a great sign for you if you believe so this sign of divine appointment as we know uh we know it clearly that it was this uh, which made uh, news for them that basically the sign that he is a divinely appointed person uh, saul is someone who has been divinely appointed the, the sign would be that the ark of god would come back to them 
the Ark of the Covenant and has been described. So this Ark, as we know, was the one that the Philistines had snatched away from the Israelites. And this Ark actually occupied the status of the Qibla. They would face this Ark uh, in the times of their wanderings. And they would, uh, before constructing, uh, before being able to go and uh, into, into the Canaan, and where, where later on we know that Solomon built their temple, it was this Ark which, which uh, was the substitute of the Qibla. And uh, this ark, or this tabut, as the Quran has uh, referred to here, the, it had remnants of uh, Moses and Aaron, and we know that the Philistines has, had conquered them. So the Quran now says that the sign of his divine appointment would be that the ark that was snatched away from them, that was taken away from them, or the Philistines would be returned to them, tahmiluhul malaika, and it would be as if the angels are bringing it back and bearing it for you. So uh, as far as this ark is concerned, uh, we have to understand that uh, uh, since their exodus from Egypt until the construction of the Baitul Maqdis, as, as I just said, which is the temple built by Solomon, uh, they would place it with great care in their tabernacle and at a specific position between curtains and would face it uh, during their devotions and supplications. Now, their rabbis and their soothsayers would turn towards it for divine guidance. And it was this ark which was the greatest source of assurance for the Israelites in difficult times and calamities. So uh, we know that uh, relics of uh, Moses and Aaron's and their families were added to it and they, they were housed in that, in that box. And this was something, of course, that we don't know, don't know the details of. But uh, this is how we are uh, told in the Quran. And this prediction, we know that it materialized word for, for word. And the Philistines placed the ark on a vehicle and pushed it over in the direction of the areas of the Israelites, probably because of becoming awe-stricken on the war measures which were adopted by Thalut or Saul and the success he achieved in them. So when Thalut actually uh, fought with them, they became overawed and they returned that ark. And the way that they returned their ark was they just consigned it uh, to a chariot and it was as if it was driven by angels and it came back to the, uh, uh, it came back to the Israelites. And this vehicle had no guide or custodian and was drawn by two oxen, uh, oxen whose young ones had been detained in their homes. And it reached its destination. And obviously, this can only happen uh, because of the help of the angels. I mean, they, they just placed that ark uh, on those two oxen. Uh, it was something that was drawn by two oxen. And uh, the rest was just left to, to, to God. And this happened that uh, we, we, we know that this is how the, the book of Samuel actually records these details. So let me just uh, look at uh, some of the details which... Uh, chapter 6, 7, uh, and verses 7 to 13 of uh, Samuel 1 record this. Now then, get a cart ready with two cows and have calved, that have calved, which means that they have given birth and have never been yoked. Hitch the cows to the, ark, to the cart, but take their calves away and pen them up. Take the ark of the Lord and put it on the cart, and in a chest beside it, put the gold objects you are sending back to him as a guilt offering. Send it on its way, but keep watching it. So they did it this. They took two such cows and hitched them to the cart and penned up their calves. They placed the ark of the, of the Lord on the cart and, and along it the chest containing the gold rats and the models of, of the tumors. Then the cows went straight up towards Beth Shemesh, keeping on the road and lowing all the way. They did not return to the right or to the left. The rulers of the Philistines followed them as far as the border of Beth Shemesh. Now the people of Beth Shemesh were harvesting their wheat in the valley. And when they looked up and saw the ark, they rejoiced at the sight. So the Bible, as you can see, clearly describes how this was uh, returned to them. And this was a divine sign, actually, that as far as the Quran is concerned, it has given this sign to them that this divine appointment would be that they would be uh, uh, given this, they would be returned this ark and they would be, they would have this chance once again to rejoice at receiving it. So when the Israelites were deprived of this ark, their elders regarded it as an, as an event which stripped them of their grandeur and glory. And the whole nation mourned this for almost 20 years. So there could not have been any better assigned than this ark that could signify, signify that the appointment of Talut was from God. Obvious in it were glad tidings that now that the Israelites have turned to God, they would also regain their lost glory, just as they had regained the ark. 
One thing that you might uh, want to know here is that the biblical version in this regard is different from that of the Quran. So it says that the Philistines had placed the ark on the vehicle and pushed it towards the areas of Israelites before the appointment of Talud. So remember, the Quran is telling us that this cart on which these, uh, this ark was placed uh, would be a sign of divine appointment of Talut himself, and they would uh, regain that ark. But if you look at the account of the Bible, you'll see that uh, it says that the Philistines had placed the ark on the vehicle uh, much before the appointment of Talut. But this version is refuted by other passages of the Bible itself. And we know that if this is true, then the Philistines had returned the ark just after seven months fearing its magical powers. Then there are passages in the Bible which are rendered meaningless. Uh, for example, if I uh, take this passage, which is Samuel 1 and chapter number 7, verse 2, it says, It was a long time, 20 years in all, that the ark remained at kiriath Jerem, and all the people of Israelite of Israel mourned and sought after the Lord. So you can see that this is, uh, uh, I mean, clearly, which is mentioned here, that, that if Kiria Jerim was a territory of the Israelites and the ark was with them, then why did all the people of Israel mourn it? And what is the meaning of the words sought after the Lord? So we can clearly see that this is a discrepancy and uh, this could not have happened. And uh, we know that scholars have pointed out that the book of Samuel has many contradictory passages in it, and it is difficult to differentiate the right, the spurious from the, from the uh, right ones. And therefore, we know that from the study of the Quran, how the Quran has actually corrected certain passages in certain parts of the Bible, and which of course is something uh, which is a blessing for us because we now get to know the whole picture in its totality. So, okay, before I go on, uh, because this is uh, now uh, one of the generals of Saul uh, whose uh, attack is now being described and uh, uh, we'll have some more things to say about it. But before we move on, if you have any questions regarding what we have studied up till now, please raise them. Thank you, Dr. Salim. Shaban Ansari, please go ahead. Assalamu alaikum. ایمانی so, unko kya, uh, matlab, unko to aisa ko nahi hai na, wada. so you see, uh, as far as uh, people who are not the Ishmaelites are concerned, they are considered as a, I mean, they're, of course, when they accept faith, they'll not become uh, Ishmaelites per se, but it's like being added to their group. So, uh, so basically, the promise is with the Ishmaelites, but all those people who, I mean, uh, help them in any way or they have become part of them, will also be the recipients of the reward that uh, the Ishmaelites would receive. Because you see, they have now become part of them. So the promise is with the Ishmaelites. But if anyone joins the Ishmaelites, uh, they will also receive those uh, promises. But primarily, it is the Ishmaelites who must behave and who must, uh, I mean, uh, regain their position of uh, their covenant in which they have to obey that covenant. So anyone who sides with them, I mean, they have to do it first. But all other people who side with them, will naturally become a secondary recipient of all those rewards. Yes, correct. تو کیا یہ سبھی کی شروع سے یہی عادت ہے کہ خود سے کچھ نہیں اخلاقی طور پر حالت بہتر کرنی بس کوئی ایک مقرر ہو جائے تو بس وہی سب کچھ ٹھیک کر دے So as you can see from a certain Bible passage that I read they said that because all other nations of the world have kings so we would also like to have a king so they, they did not regard their prophet to be king and they said that they want a king who should have that worldly grandeur and glory the way other kings have so there were several other dynasties of kings which were uh, uh, adjacent to their own uh, territory and they were enamored by them. They were uh, inspired by them. And it was just this worldly glamour that made them 
awe-inspired and awe-stricken that they should also have a king like him. And look, the answer of God is that, well, I'm your king. I'm there for you. But they insisted that we want a king in physical form. So basically, it's out of uh, following other nations that were around them who had kings. Thank you, Dr. Salim. Akram Patisab, please go ahead. Assalamualaikum, sir. Waalaikum <clears throat> salam. Uh, Madam, I have two, two questions. I will ask one now and one uh, second one when you give me a chance again. You can uh, you can go with both right now. Okay. My first question is that um, I didn't quite understand what forced a uh, Palestinian to uh, send the ark on uh, the, the box and ark on its way to you know what 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 forced that. So this is it. It seems that. Uh, the uh, appointment of Talut or Saul, as the as the Bible calls him, uh, was the was the reason because this was the time that now they were they started to regain uh, their lost glory by honoring the the, the covenant of God. Uh, they started to become strong, and these people who were of course living adjacent, they they saw that now they are rising once again. So it does seem that basically it was that fear and that cowardice which already was in them, but when they saw uh, Talut, if you study his story, uh, the uh, Saul story in the Bible, you'll know that he was a very grand person, as the Quran has already pointed out, that he was a person who had a very tall physique, he was a very impressive person. And the way that he had uh, gone about in the era of Sham Samuel, the prophet, uh, in reforming the Israelites and in trying to make them a nation once again, this was something that created a lot of uh, awe. Uh, in the hearts of the Philistines. And they, they just thought that, well, the only way to evade this would be that they return their ark and just make peace with him. So they, just to make peace with them and the, the, in other words, they accepted yes. their defeat. Or they, right. They, they, yeah. They, mm -hmm. okay. Thank you. And second question is, I don't know if this uh, related to this topic. I'm always wondering <clears throat> when there's a Israelites, they, they stayed in uh, those uh, desert for 40 years. How did they, uh, you know, um, how how did they uh, achieve all the things that, uh, that, that you, as a, in a life you need, like, you know, uh, from, right from food to housing and to the, and to, 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 to the garments and everything else. We need hundreds of things to survive for 40 years. There was a couple of generations probably. So, uh, so remember years. this was, they were actually give, they were honored by God. They were, as the Quran has uh, enumerated at a number of places, uh, food was given in the form of man and salva. Mm -hmm. uh, we know that the clouds would, would actually shadow over them so that they would be shielded from heat. And there were a number of other things. If you read the Bible, you'll find out the, the, during their wandering in, in the desert how the Almighty actually looked after them. So all the things that they needed for their survival in that desert for 40 years was, was, was given to them. And this was actually the reason that a whole new generation flourished uh, in those 40 years. And then we know that uh, after Moses had passed away, uh, Joshua, his, his, uh, uh, his successor, in his uh, leadership, they were able to invade Canaan and, and occupy it. So this was something of a divine help as 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 well. It's not just that they did it themselves. No, I was because the month salva is mentioned. Nothing else is mentioned. I mean, you need hundreds of so that, things. I mean, if you would like to know more details, you just read the book of Exodus in, in the Old Testament, okay. and you'll see how uh, how they were helped in in many ways. Okay, good. I I have the I will read that. I have the Bible. Thank you, sir. Thank you, Imran. Imran, please. Thank you. Thank you, thank you. Uh, Salaam alaikum, Dr. Shazad. Uh, well, actually, this is one of the questions I wanted to ask that uh, we know uh, Joshua or Yusha bin Nun, he captured uh, the Palestine uh, because they were able to enter the new generation. And because at the time, Philistines were there and they were driven out. So my question is, how long after that did the Philistine recapture the Palestine area? Um, and then... So, so basically, how long after Joshua did Prophet Samuel um, came into power or, or, or became the prophet? And so you see, to... uh, we know that Prophet Samuel lived around a thousand years BC. Okay. And uh, you can calculate from that. And Moses was around, I mean, around 1500 BC. 1500, yeah. Yeah. So it was somewhere in between. So if you look at the lives of the prophets, they were longish lives. Uh, but it should be somewhere between 1200 BC, I would, I suppose, mm -hmm. uh, and 1300 BC. 
that it's makes difficult sense. To give the, yeah, it's dif difficult to give the exact time, but it's somewhere between that time. Uh, so that's good. Very good. Thank you. Thank you very much. That's very helpful. But, but my question is, so initially the Israelites had driven the Philistines out under the reign of Prophet Joshua, right? And then the Philistine had recaptured the land. Uh, and that's not, when... Not, them... not all land, part okay. of the land. So you see, see. Uh, it's not that they had captured the complete land. This is part of that territory that they had driven them out from. And uh, it was a big territory, but... Uh, I mean, they were still there, but ultimately it was in this in his era of Samuel that they were able to de redo it. Otherwise, uh, in his own era, just before that, a uh, major part of their of their territory had been taken away. I see. I see. Okay, so that's when Samuel and then uh, the Daud or David comes, and then he got right. crowned and right. Solomon. Right. So that's the golden era starts after this fight when when they took over. Okay. Thank you. Thank you very much. Bismillah Jamizi Ahmed, please go ahead. So, Dr. Sunni, my question is, uh, when uh, Abraham settled the Israelites in Canaan and then the Egyptians took them as slaves, mm -hmm. now they're coming back, of course, we see with Moses and they're staying in the desert and then the coming of Samuel. So the Philistines, mm -hmm. who are the Philistines then? Because the, if the Egyptians had taken the Israelites back as slaves, so who are these people, Philistines, who are living in Philistines and who are we referring to? Because they were the people who after that, when once they had been captured, I mean, they were taken away. It's not ah. that uh, it, uh, the land of Canaan was left totally devoid of people. So there were neighboring people who came into that land and they, they once again started to settle there. And okay. they were called the Philistines. Yeah. Okay. So Thank you me. see, uh, this mm -hmm. is one whole uh, branch of Abraham's progeny. And we uh -huh. know that the people who were in the times of uh, Joseph, when there was a uh, severe famine, uh, yeah. that they had to vacate that area. But you see, vacation doesn't mean that they were that it remained vacated all through. Where there were other, the, uh, I, I suppose. I mean, I'm not yeah. exactly sure, but I do suppose it was other adjacent nations who then came to occupy uh, the land of Palestine. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Salim. I had a question myself. So why does Allah not mention Nabi Shamil alayhi salam's name? He, ke he keeps on saying the Nabi lahum or Nabi him. You see, this is something which the Quran does very often. Uh, it's not just in this case, but if you read the Quran anywhere which in which there is some historical episode under discussion, it leaves out so many names, details, uh, because you see, the Quran is is not a book which was revealed in isolation. It had a background, established history was traveling with it, and people knew uh, what it was discussing. So it was like a redundant thing that if the Quran would point out certain things, because people were well aware of all this history. So when it said their their prophet, uh, everyone knew that the, the, their prophet at that in particular time uh, was only Samuel uh, who was present. So it was something of a well-known thing, and the people of the book also knew this. And as I said, this is a very, very, uh, I mean, it's a very common feature of the Quran. It's not just here. If you look at all the historical episodes, it leaves out some of the major names at times. But it's not that it's missing out on those names. It's, it's only that those names are already known. And it's like an extra detail, which the Quran often does not partake on. So does Allah want us to supplement the Quran with the previous books? Like as Of course, as yes. Okay. You see, uh, I can, you can clearly see that if you don't read the Bible, especially uh, in the, this particular uh, passage that we are starting today, uh, uh, although the Quran has made its point, but you see a number of details uh, would, would, would evade us that what happened, who are these people, and when the Quran says, Alam uh, uh, and it says, Alam so it's like uh, referring to a part of history and creating that question in your mind that, well, who are these people and why are the, the Ishmaelites being asked to draw a lesson from them and what exactly uh, is the, the, the thing that they did so in a very right way that these Ishmaelites are being asked to follow them. So these are like supplementary details, which when known to us, they make us complete a picture. Uh, but it's not that if you don't know these details, that the lesson that you can draw from these verses would be incomplete. It's only that more color would be added to it. Thank you very much, Dr. Salim. That was it for all the questions for now. Okay. So let's go on to the next part. Fasala Talutu Bil Junud Kala in Nalaha Mubutalikum binahar. 
فمن شرب منه فليس مني ومن لم يطعمه فانه مني الا من اغترف غرفه بيديه فشربوا منه الا قليلا منهم فلما جاوزه هو والذين امنوا معه قالوا لا طاقه لنا اليوم بجالوت وجنود قال الذين يظنون انهم ملاقو ربهم انهم ملاقو الله كم من فئه قليله غلبت فئه كثيره then after becoming the king of the israelites when thalut marched out with his army he told people god had decided to put you to test through a rivulet the test will be that he who drinks from it shall not remain my companion and he who would not drink anything from this rivulet shall be my companion except if someone tastes a palmful he may so this is the test that we can see uh, it's not mentioned in the bible the way the quran is mentioned the, the bible mentions another test but you see uh, when talut went out for the war and for that uh, battle he wanted to check whether he was whether he had true followers sincere people who would uh, who would fight at his command and so he said that well people if you are going to be tested and this rivulet the small river you are not going to drink any water from it and anyone who does so except if he drinks a very palmful a very 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 meager amount from it then that is fine but if you start drinking then that person will not belong to my my battalion and as the quran says fasharabu minhu illa qalilam minhum but it so happened that except a few of them all drank from that rivulet so they did not even listen to him and they just drank like anything so then when saul crossed the rivulet and those of his companions also who had adhered to their faith and saw the armies then those who had failed the test said we are not in a position to combat goliath and his warriors today so this is how uh, one of the things which is mentioned in the bible is that the campaign was to combat the philistines who at that time were led by goliath so this is the same goliath uh, you, you might have seen the movie uh in which we have uh, david and goliath uh, fighting each other and of course this is the quranic uh, story it's also a biblical story so goliath was basically a general of the philistines and so talut fought with him and the quran has actually called G- goliath as jalut so in the bible we have the word goliath for the same a person we have the word jalut uh in the book uh, of uh, of of samuel so uh, let me just also cite for you uh, the book of samuel here in which you'll see that how these uh, this war actually took place so it says now the philistines gathered their forces for war and assembled at sukkah in juda they pitched camp at ephes zimim between sukkah and izeh so these are all places and these are all biblical places uh, in, in in that area saul and the israelites assembled and camped in the valley of elah and drew up their battle line to meet the philistines the philistines occupied one hill and the israelites another with the valley between them so this is the war setting that you can clearly see that had uh, that had now become clear that the the camps were pitched against one another we we see that one hill was occupied uh, by the philistines and the other hill was occupied by the israel uh, israelites so uh, you can see that uh, one of the words which the quran has said is or cited here is that uh, you can see from the previous verse that when they met each other remember they were outnumbered but the brave people among them they said uh, i mean the, the people who were weak, weak and faint hearted they said that we do not have any uh, we cannot find we cannot fight jalut we cannot fight goliath because they have he has a huge army but the people who were bestowed with faith their words were uh, we are not i mean the people who were uh, had lost their 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 own courage they said we are not in a position to to combat goliath and his warriors today but the other people were and they said at this those of them who believed that they have to meet god cried out now this is uh, another part that i'm just going to first read the arabic verse which says kam min fi'atin qalilatin ghalabat fi'atan kaseera bi iznillah wallahu ma'as sabirin so those of them who believed that they have to meet god cried out rest assured because at many an instance a small group has by god's grace vanquished mighty groups and god is with those who endure with fortitude so walamma barazu li jalut wa junudihi qalu rabbana afrigh alaina sabran wa sabbit aqdamana wa ansurna 'alal qaumil kafirin and it was these true muslims 
who when encountered Goliath and his warriors prayed, Lord, bless us with perseverance, make us firm of foot, and make us prevail over these disbelievers. So these are the words who, uh, who were said because if a person dying for the cause of God, if dying is dearer to him than living, then we know that uh, such a person, uh, because of the fact that he believes death will not end his life, he will be granted real life uh, and he would meet, uh, meet the Almighty. So we know that Jonathan was the son of Talut. Jonathan was the son of Saul. And it, it is in all probability that he spoke these words, uh, uh, which have been cited here by the Quran, that there are many instances there in which a small group is able to, to, to conquer a larger group. So it, it seems from the Bible that these words were uttered by, uh, by Jonathan, who was the son of Saul. And we see these words being cited once again in the book of Samuel 1, chapter 14 and verse 6. It says, Jonathan said to his, his young armor bearer, come, let us go over the outpost of those uncircumcised fellows. Perhaps the Lord will act in our behalf. Nothing can hinder the Lord from saving, whether by many or by few. So basically, it was Jonathan who said to, his, uh, to, this, uh, to these, these words, that as far as people are concerned, that at times they are meager in resources, but success actually comes from God's command. And so these are the words that uh, we know were, were uttered. And uh, we also know that in those times, uh, all those who were gathered there, uh, I mean, there were people who, who could not save themselves simply because it was God's uh, command that even if a small group is able to challenge a larger group because they adhere to God's covenant, then God extraordinarily helps them. So we know that uh, uh, from the book of Samuel, once again, uh, Samuel 1, chapter 17, and this is uh, verse 47, it says, All those gathered were, will know that it is not by the sword or spear that the Lord saves, for the battle is the Lord's, and he will give all of you into your hands. So what a beautiful thing uh, he has uttered here. He said that, well, you don't win by the sword or by the spear. Because that is just a means of your fighting. It's basically the help of your Lord which makes you win. And that is how the Quran has actually referred uh, to the faith of these believers. So the Quran says that, Walamma barazuli jalut. So we have already uh, studied these words. It says that, rest assured that as at many an instance, a small group has by God's grace vanquished mighty groups. So this, these are the words spoken by Jonathan. And God is with those who endure with fortitude. So, and it was these true Muslims who when encountered Goliath and his warriors prayed, Lord, bless us with perseverance, make us firm of foot and make us prevail over these disbelievers. So now we have the next part of the battle. And it says that thus their prayer was accepted. Remember the prayer that they said was Rabbana of Sabran was sub Afrigalaina Sabran was sub bit of Damana. Oh God, give us that perseverance, bless us with steadfastness so that we can conquer our enemy. So this prayer was accepted. And the Quran says, for Hazamuhum that they decimated them, they destroyed them. And at God's directive, they routed those enemies of theirs. And David slew Goliath. And God bestowed on him sovereignty and wisdom and taught him what he wants to teach such people of his. And in reality, had God not driven away one by the other, the earth would have been filled with anarchy. But in this manner, he has driven away people because God is gracious to the dwellers of this world. So, as we know that uh, basically David, or the prophet David, and the king David later on, he was a, he was a, he was a soldier, in fact, from the army, and uh, he basically killed Goliath, who was the, the ar he was a general from the Philistines, from, the Saul, from Saul's army, or Talut's army, it was David, uh, who challenged him, and we have very graphic details of the war which took place uh, in the Bible, you can look it up, and you can see how uh, David actually challenged Goliath and he slew him, all, uh, even though uh, Goliath was much more stronger than him. But then, as the Quran says, 
Uh, so this is how the Quran, I mean, uh, actually portrays that at times the facade, as the Quran uh, uses the word, the disorder, the anarchy which is causing this earth, this is done away with. This is uh, the way the, the God resolves this anarchy is that he sends people uh, of his own and they are able to restore uh, peace and uh, subsistence for people on this earth. So this is a part of the history of the Israelites, which was recounted basically to the Ishmaelites. And we have seen from the Bible how, uh, how clearly these uh, verses corroborate the Quran and how the Quran actually at certain instances does correct the Bible as well. But the thing is that in order to draw this inspiration, this was an incident which was well known to the Ishmaelites. They knew that this was, this was their own, uh, the history of their predecessors and uh, how very few people. So remember the, the, the lesson to be drawn is that it was a number of, the, the, the enemy outnumbered them. So it was there in vast numbers. And there were very few people who passed the test of Talut. And most of them drank from that rivulet. And this actually uh, was a big eye-opener for Talut. And he, he understood that his, he didn't ha have many people whom he could count on. But then Jonathan, who was the son of Talut, he said, that, well, at times when we are blessed with this faith and we know we are fighting for God's, for the will of God and we are strong in faith, then at Many occasions, come in fiatin kalilatin, ghalabat fiatin kathira. And on many occasions, a small group overcomes a larger group. So this was a message to the Muslims or the Ishmaelites that if you are small in number, you don't get frustrated because this is precisely what happened to the Israelites. That they were small in number, but they stuck to their faith and their covenant, and God helped them, and He helped them in in, in a tremendous way. So in a similar way, they would also be helped. So you see how. Uh, the Almighty draws these parallels from past history. And something uh, here is, is, I mean, that we know of is something that we have to understand that this history was also well known to the Ishmaelites. And as someone just asked, that is precisely why some of the details were not given in full because it was a well-known part of their history. And then it says, تِلْكَ آيَاتُ اللَّهِ نَتْلُوهَ عَلَيْكَ بِالْحَقِّ وَإِنَّكَ لَمِنَ الْمُرْسَلِينَ these are the revelations of God which we are reciting to you in all truth and doubtless you are among God's messengers. So you see, this is one of the styles or the, I would say, a feature of the Quran that uh, whenever an incident from the Bible is cited in the Quran, at times, uh, at times it corrects it, at times it modifies it and at times it corroborates it. And it says that, well, this is a big proof of the fact that you are from amongst those who, whom God has sent. Because you are now giving the true picture of the incident which was recorded in a previous scripture in a distorted way. And this is a sign that you are a messenger of God because only God could have corrected this incident and portrayed it in the way uh, that is the right, that portrays the right situation. So this in itself is an argument in favor of his prophethood. And uh, you, you'll see this verse or verses which are similar to it uh, being cited all over the Quran. Uh, whenever the Quran corrects an episode from the Bible and it says that, well, you could have only done that because you are the recipient of God's knowledge. And from that knowledge, you're able to give the true account of the incident instead of the distorted one that might come before you from the previous scriptures. Right. Tilka rusulu faddalna ba'dahum ala ba'd minhum man kallam Allahu wa rafa'a ba'dahum darajat. The Israelites also know this, but do not accept it. Because among these messengers, we have exalted some, of, some above the others, such that to some God spoke directly, and others he raised to a lofty status in some other capacity. And at the end, we gave Jesus, son of Mary, extremely manifest signs and helped him through the Holy Spirit. Consequently, it was because of this relative superiority of one messenger to the other that the followers of one messenger rejected the other. And if God wanted, these who succeeded the messengers would not have fought against one another after overtly manifest arguments had 
become, have become evident to them. But God did not want to force people to the right path. Hence, they disagreed among themselves. Thus, some among them professed faith in these messengers and some rejected them. They are rejecting you, O prophet, for the same reasons as well. And had God wanted, they would never have fought against one another. But God, according to his wisdom, does what he pleases. So once again, you see, once that incident has been finished, uh, the Quran says that this is how the correction has, has takes place, that at times the Almighty, uh, when it, he corrects this incident and, and, and divulges the true form of that incident through a prophet of God. But uh, the Quran has also said that because of the fact that people have, uh, have prejudice against their own prophet, so they would not believe a correction made by a future prophet, or they would uh, indulge in in uh, in extreme or absolute superiority of their own prophet, and uh, they would not realize that uh, God has not given absolute superiority to any prophet, any prophet. It's only relative superiority, and that is in a certain part or a certain area. Uh, a particular prophet might have a particular trait that the other prophet might not have. So the example that is given here, for example, is the uh, pro example of Moses, so he was he conversed with God, and the only prophet who conversed with God was Moses. And Jesus, we know, was helped by the Holy Spirit, and uh, the help here, of course, means that he was able to raise the dead to life. He he uh, cured the lepers. He had other miracles as well, and these were all given to him because, being the last prophet of God, he uh, of the Israelites of God. I mean, of course, he was sent as the last prophet uh, among the Israelites, and. His purpose was to awaken the uh, Israelites from their slumber. And after 2,000 years of prophets being spent to them, one after the other, they had kept on this acceptance and rejection. And a major part of their, uh, their tenure ended up in rejection. So he was sent for the last time as the last prophet. And he was given these profound miracles so that he could awaken them. But we know what happened and they tried to even crucify him. So the Quran basically tells us that these... Uh, relative superiority matters should not be a cause of making one nation uh, boast his prophet or its prophet in a way that you are able to undermine other prophets of God. These are all prophets of God who have their particular, uh, a particular, I would say, traits. And these traits are not something which should be a means of uh, a superiority. They are basically traits given to each prophet according to the circumstances that he would encounter. And uh, we know that uh, God does not force people to come to the truth. Which means that had God wanted, these people would not have fought each other in spite of these clear signs that had come to them. But God's way is not that he forces people to accept the truth. He gives them the choice to accept the truth. And then the Quran says, So when this choice was given to them, they did differ. So for Winhuman Amana, Wominhuman Kafar. So there were people who professed faith, and there were people who differed and did not profess faith. And as a result, uh, now also it's being uh, it's like relating that past incident to the present. So the Israelites, the way that incident is narrated to the Muslims or the believers, now these believers are being told that if this is something that has happened in the history of the Israelites and which you can draw inspiration from, it's going to happen again. And it has happened again, in fact, because now that the Prophet has come, once again, there are people who are accepting him and there are people who are rejecting him. So, had God wanted, they would not have fought with one another. But God does what he wants, which means that he gives them the choice to do what they think is right. So if they fight with one another, then it is basically because of their own uh, prejudice, because of their own jealousy. So uh, before we now uh, move on to the next uh, part of this uh, of this section, so if you have any questions until now, please raise them. Thank you, Dr. Slane. There is a question in the chat that asks, is Prophet Samuel ever mentioned in the Quran? So not mentioned by name. He's mentioned in, in, uh, uh, in, in form of an insinuation. We just read that insinuation. It says, So their prophet said to them, so the name is not mentioned, uh, but we know, I mean, uh, Samuel is the person, uh, is, is the prophet who is under discussion. Thank you. Bismillah Tirmizi Ahmed, please go ahead. So Dr. Salim, my question to you is that uh, Abraham was 4,000 years ago, Moses mm -hmm. 3,500 years ago, Samuel 3,000 years ago, Jesus 2,000 years ago. So it almost mm -hmm. seems that 
Allah gave uh, the Israelites a chance for almost 2,000 years and they they did not take it. So my question to you is, you know, Muslims now for the past 1,500 years since the prophets come, we soon seem to have completely gone off track. We are completely divided. Is mm -hmm. it our reckoning right now? The way it seems, you know, with all the Muslims, the plight that we're in, is it possible? Even though we're not the munafiks because that is just probably from that time, but People say they believe in the Prophet, but nobody's willing to, you know, actually follow the Quran or, you know, they, they twist it according to the, the way they want. What is your take on it? So you see, I mean, my take is not as important as what the Quran itself has said. The Quran says yeah. that, you see, for the progeny of Abraham, the, the law is that they'll be punished in this world and they'll be rewarded in this world. So they'll be punished if they fail to abide by God's covenant. And this promise is with both branches of uh, Abraham. So one of them was the Israelites who have fulfilled, they, they, they've gone over their term and it's, they are now finished. And now the same uh, reckoning is being faced by Ishmaelites. So today the Ishmaelites are, are subdued. And uh, it's exactly in accordance with the law which God has for the progeny of Abraham that because of the fact that they are not abiding by their covenant, that now they feel, they, they find themselves subdued before other nations of the world. So basically, it's uh, it's like a tit-for-tat thing. God says in Urtum or the Navi, I mean, if you return to what you uh, what you should do, I'll return my favor as well. So uh, basically, for the for the progeny of Abraham, it's a, it's a simple thing that you have to pass that test. You have to abide by that covenant. And once you do so, God will make you superior, not through any fight or through any battle that you need to fight, but through the circumstances that he'll create on the globe. So all that they need to do is uh, establish truth and justice in their own in their own cells. And if they are not doing this, God says, you shall definitely be punished. So there could be other nations whose reckoning could be left to the hereafter. But for the Ishmaelites and the Israelites or the progeny of Abraham, they have to face this reckoning in this world. And this reckoning, as I said, is, it goes both ways. That if they fare well, they'll be uh, given the, the, the leadership of the nations of the world. And if they don't fare well, They'll be subdued before them, and exactly, precisely, this is what is being hap is what is happening. So today, if the Ishmaelites are being subdued and we find them to be at their decadent state, it's because of their it's their own doing, and and it's God's promise with them that if they rise, He shall make them rise once again. So basically, just because we don't have, of course, we don't have another prophet coming since Hazur is the last prophet, but our reckoning can be as Muslims. We will not get away with it. We will be accountable in this world before the hair, you know, before so, the end I mean, of the world. This accountability is for the Ishmaelites. Remember, Muslims, uh, that's a wider term. Ishmaelites, for them, is this uh, reckoning which is going on today. Basically, the progeny of Abraham is the recipient of this punishment. And the covenant of God was with them. So remember, for, with the Israelites, the, the situation was that a number of prophets came to them. So it, not, it was not just the four that you enumerated. Based basically, one after the other, if you look at the book of, uh, I mean, the, the, the book of prophets in the Bible, you'll see how one prophet would go and he would baptize the next one and say that I'm handing over my baton to the next one and to the next one. So it was like one after the other. And that is why the Quran says that the reckoning, uh, their reckoning is going to be tough because it's not just that uh, prophets would come to them in, 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 in gaps. It, they came to them one after the other in succession and Jesus was the last of them. So from Moses to Jesus, you can, if you just start counting, there was hardly a time when there was not a prophet amongst them. But this was not the case with the Ishmaelites, right? because of the fact that Ishmaelites, they were the recipients of the last uh, book of God, which was to be preserved. So it's like effectively the book of God taking the place of the prophet himself or the last prophet himself, because now the word of God is preserved. So it's like that book carrying on with that work. And now people being told that now you have this manifesto with you. If you adhere to it, uh, you'll find pleasure with God. And if you don't, you'll be beaten in this world, which means, of course, that you'll be uh, subdued by other nations. And this is exactly what is happening. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Dr. Slim. We have a question in the chat that asks, is Ruh al-Quds or Ruh al-Amin always referring to Jibreel? Uh, Jibreel right. Correct. Okay. Um, Shabnam, please go ahead. Thank you. Uh, sir, I have mentioned that you mentioned that Ishmael and Ismail are very good. Sir, this is probably more than the amount of Arab, Saudi Arab. Sir, what is the 
لائف گزار رہے ہیں وہ تو سب ڈیوڈ نہیں ہیں دے ہیو لاٹس آف ویلتھ اور منرلس ایکسیٹرا اور وہ اپیرنٹلی تو غفلت میں ہیں سب ڈیوڈ تو نہیں ہیں دے آر انجوائنگ دیئر لائف دیم سیلف نا ایکچولی آئی مین یو ڈونٹ سب سب ڈیوڈ مین دیٹ دے آئی مین دے آر ناٹ دا لیڈرز آف دا ورلڈ اینڈ اٹس ناٹ جسٹ دا عرب نیشنز اٹس ناٹ جسٹ سعودی عربیا دیٹ وی ٹاکنگ آف یو یو فائنڈ جارڈن یو فائنڈ موراکو اینڈ دیز آر دا سم آف دا ہیشمائٹ کنگڈمس ان وچ دی بنیش مائل آر اسکیٹرڈ سو یو سی دے آر ناٹ ایٹ ون پلیس دے آر ناٹ جسٹ ایٹ ون پلیس دے آر ناٹ جسٹ ان دی عربین پیننسولا they are scattered in some of the gulf countries they are found in jordan they are found in morocco and some of the other countries so it's in their collectivity because of the fact they are not concentrated in, in one in one country they are they are they are found it in various countries and in the case of the arabs also if you look at their uh, i mean look at their history and the way they are behaving now i mean they are still a, they are subjugated to the west so they are basically a vessel of the west Uh, they are an ally to the United States, uh, if you look at that. And if they are not, uh, I mean, they don't seem to be subjugated uh, because of the fact that uh, basically they have uh, made friends with an enemy. And this, the only reason for their survival or for their uplift is that they seem to be their ally. So I think you should not be mistaken that this, uh, this, uh, uh, this comfortable lifestyle is not what the Quran is talking about. The Quran is saying that if you look about your own selves and if you believe in god and you uh, have your truth and justice prevail amongst yourselves then the ishmaelites as a collectivity would be the leader of the rest of mankind you see this is the promise to have a good life in your own self is just one part of it and again as i said that's another relative thing because you don't have that thing in actual form so basically the promise is that if ishmaelites would adhere to god's word they will be leaders of all mankind the rest of mankind and this we know is not happening uh, sir uh, lekin wo safar to nahi kare na punishment kaisi unhe parwai nahi hai wo apne maste hai apne kingdom ko lekar wo to they are not worried at all they are not feeling ke wo punish ho rahe hain wo wo friends bana ke bed i mean if you as i said this is just one part i mean uh, they are not the all the ishmaelites and this is not what uh, the quran has said ishmaelites they are scattered uh, in other countries as well and as far as these uh, these arabs are concerned i mean uh, it's not that uh, i mean the, the, the quran is not talking about any internal comfort that a country might have they could have that comfort so the quran is not talking about a comfort position it is telling us that the promise is that they will prevail over all other nations so the promise yeah. is not i mean the, the the subjugation does not mean that they would not be comfortable the subjugation means that they will never be able to lead the rest of mankind this leadership promise is something which the quran has made and this we can clearly see is not happening right sir so may i ask another question maryam if yeah if please go ahead sir ye jo aap uh, historical excerpts padhte hain uh, jo cheeze padhte aap bible se sir ye old or new testament to nahi hai wo to, wo to reveal ki gayi thi ye human effort hai jo usme historical no, so this, baatein so I mean, these are part, this part of Old Testament. So Old Testament has a whole chapter on the, on the books of the prophets. So these minor prophets, as we call them, Samuel, and we have Hiskiel, we have uh, Jeremiah, we have so many of the prophets, they had their own scriptures. And they are, to some extent, I mean, part of them is found in, in, in the whole of the Bible. But as I said, it's part of the Old Testament. The Old Testament to Moses. So, Musa- you see, the, As I said, Old Testament is just not a collection which was revealed to, to Moses. I mean, uh, that, is, they are the, the, that is what we call the Pentateuch. So the Pentateuch are the first five books of the Bible. They are the ones that were revealed to Moses. So the Old Testament is a, is a vaster majority of, uh, of scriptures. Sir, this is a human work, which is a collect. Compilation. Yes. Compilation. Yes. Thank yeah. you, sir. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Salim. We have questions in the chat. So this one is a bit longer, but it says, it talks about the kingship and how the Quran mentions this incident, but doesn't explicitly condemn kingship. So doesn't it leave room for Muslims to choose someone as king, even though the Bible talks against it? So remember that this is a, uh, I mean, this is an area of history of the Israelites. And this is, they talking to God and God telling them that this is not they should, what they should do. And If they do so, it, they'll just be, I mean, they will push to certain other limits and they're not listening to him. I mean, this is not a situation that can be compared in any way to the Quranic directive of uh, Amruhum Shura Bainahum or the fact that God wants people to, uh, to have their own opinion when they choose their leader. This is divine appointment by God himself uh, of, of a leader. Uh, and that, 
at their own demand. So this is an era in which, uh, I mean, uh, there's still, there was monarchy uh, and there were people, I mean, there were people living under kingships. And precisely for this reason, actually, they said that because the rest of the world has kings, they would also like a king. So this is how the Quran is actually treating a particular incident of history. It's not recommending anything. The recommendation as a Sharia is something which it has made elsewhere. Here it is just quoting something that happened in history. And God, just out of his own affection, listened to them in order to prove his own point that if they would like to live under a king, then they would ultimately be humiliated by him. And this is precisely what happened. But because initially they did not listen to him, God said, okay, you can have your own choice and you'll learn and listen from that. Thank you, Dr. Slim Jawed Ishrat. Please go ahead. Assalamu alaikum. First of all, what you are doing and what you have done is that you have given us a good idea. And we understand that Jawed Ahmed Ghamdi Sahib is the most important scholar of this world. The discussion was just now, like Jawed Ahmed Ghamdi Sahib said, we have heard a lot of things, we have heard a lot of things, we have heard a lot of things, we have heard a lot of things. एक बात उन्होंने कही थी कि जैसे अमेरिकन हैं या यूरोपियन हैं अगर ये सब मुसलमान हो जाएं तो इस्लाम कुवत में आ जाएगा जी जी आई मीन वी नीड टू हैव क्वेश्चंस दैट रिलेट टू आर Thank you. Everything is clear, Alhamdulillah. And it's okay. Thank you. Ms. Mathieu, Ms. Ahmed, please go ahead. So, uh, Dr. Saleem, the, the lady before me asked uh, that, you know, the you mentioned to her that the Hashemites are spread in Jordan, Morocco, Saudi Arabia, and uh, adjoining areas. Would the reckoning be just for the Hashemites or the Bani Ismail, as we specifically say, the tribe? Or for all the Muslims, because all the Muslims seem to be subservient right now as nations to the West. So would... see, we have to understand that the promise of God is with the progeny of Abraham. Basically, the progeny of Abraham is to behave well. Once they behave well, anyone who adds to their total, who comes and joins them, would be a secondary recipient. But in the absence of the progeny of Abraham, if the rest of, of the believers are Muslims, they become righteous. The promise is basically not with them. So the promise is with the Ishmaelites and anyone who joins the Ishmaelites, once the Ishmaelites behave well, will of course, uh, I mean, uh, uh, be re receiving that reward of leadership. So basically, remember this reckoning is of leadership and not being leader of the world. So this is like one thing. As far as sinning is concerned, as far as your other deeds are concerned, that is a separate reckoning, which will nevertheless take place on the Day of Judgment. This is a oh. separate form. This is like the law of the Almighty regarding the Ishma, uh, regarding the progeny of Abraham, that they will be the leaders of this world currently, I mean, in this world, and they lead the rest of mankind. And okay. if they don't follow God's covenant, other, leader, uh, other nations will lead them, so, and they will be vanquished before them. So basically, this is a promise of leadership. And okay. uh, reckoning, of course, is, is something which is parallel to it, and that is going to take place in the hereafter as well. So the Sayyids, basically the Sayyids, the, the, the people who call themselves Sayyids, the progeny. I mean, you see, the word Sayyid is again misleading. And the word Sayyid means the person who belongs to the Prophet's family. And we are not talking about the Prophet's family. But wouldn't that be the progeny the then? The Ishmaelites. The Pardon? Ishmaelites weren't, wasn't the Prophet descended from Ismail? Of course he was. But you see, Sayyids and Ishmaelites are two different entities. So Sayyid was a person who would be called from within the family of the Prophet, the immediate okay. family of the Prophet. It's okay. not that everyone is going to become an immediate family of the Prophet. Okay. Thank you so much. Thank you, Dr. Slim. For the Ruh al-Quds, this is my question. You said that that's Jibreel alayhi salam in the Quran. Is, is mm -hmm. the Holy Spirit also Gabriel in Christianity? Because in Christianity, right. from what I understand, he's an archangel. Yeah. So you see, uh, I mean, when they speak of the Holy Spirit, uh, I mean, they speak of that Holy Spirit in their own context and they uh, regard it to be a part of Godhead. I mean, he that is someone uh, he's, he's part of Godhead. But you see, when it occurs in the Quran, wherever it occurs in the Quran, I'm talking about the Quran. So the Quran specifically uses the word Holy Spirit for Gabriel and he, it uses it as a, 
as a divine sanction or the divine help from the Almighty. You see the words are وَأَيَّدْنَاهُ بِرُوحِ الْقُدُسِ That we help them uh, through the Holy Spirit. So this is like God uh, saying that through his archangel, he was able to help them. So in, I'm talking about just the, just the Quran. I mean, in the Bible, it has a different connotation. It, it, their passages, it, they might have a different connotation. But within the Quran, Ruhul Amin, Ruhul Qudus, Ar Ruh, they all relate to, uh, to Gabriel. Thank you very much, Dr. Salim. We have 15 minutes remaining, and I know you wanted to finish the last part. Yeah. Um, so and, just uh, just let's uh, uh, do this last part, and then we'll have some more time for questions, which are which can be off-topic questions. Thank you. So now uh, we come back to the Quran, and uh, you see, you'll see that the topic of infaq is taken up afresh once again, because you see, in between we had that incident from the era of the Israelites, and then the Almighty once again telling people that how at times by giving uh, veneration to some prophet of God, people end up uh, fighting with one another. And this has happened again you know, when the prophet has come and they would not like the, the, the last prophet to come from uh, some other part of Abraham's progeny. And this jealousy has once again taken over them. And so once this topic has finished, we find the Quran going back to its original topic of infaq and jihad. Now infaq is taken up and that is, Ya yuhal lazina amanu anfiqu mimma razaqnaakum min qabli Believers, leave them to themselves and spend of what we have given you for the cause of God before that day arrives when there shall be no bargaining. Neither shall friendship with someone be of use nor shall any intercession be of avail. And in reality, the rejectors of that day are the ones who are unjust to their souls. So, uh, I mean, this verse doesn't have any difficulty and it says that the spending in charity is a thing that is going to save people. Of course, uh, this is understood that they have faith in God. But then when the time comes for that charity to be spent, they are the ones who are vigilant and they are the ones who know that it is their own deeds who, which are going to save them. And as the Quran says that that is the day in which no friendship will be of avail, no benefit will be gained from any a friendship nor any intercession. So rest assured, I mean, as far as the believers are concerned, it's their own deeds will which will account for their success. And they are not, I mean, the disbelievers in not are not in any way going to be uh, given any success because of any intercession or any friendship with someone else. And with this uh, introductory sentence, we now come to the one of the greatest verses of the Quran, which actually glorifies and introduces the Almighty in a in a very, very a specific light and uh, it goes like this Allahu la ilaha illa huwa al-hayyul qayyum la ta'khuzuhu sinatun wa la nawm lahu ma fi as-samawati wa ma fi al-ard man zal ladhi yashfa'u indahu illa bi'izni ya'lamu ma bayna aydihim wa ma khalfahum wa la yuhituna bi shay'in min 'ilmihi illa bima sha' wasi'a kursiyuhu as-samawati wal ard on that day, people will have to deal with God only. God, there is no deity but He, the living, the sustainer. Neither slumber nor sleep overtakes Him. All that is in the heavens and the earth belongs to Him only. Who can intercede with Him for someone except by His permission? He knows all that lies before people and what is after them. And they cannot grasp any part of his knowledge except what he allows. His dominion prevails in the heavens and the earth, and their protection does not tire him the slightest. And he is exalted, the glorious one. So this verse of the throne or the Ayatul Kursi, as we commonly know it, is a, it's a glorious uh, verse. I say I, I can uh, feel you can feel the words, the way they portray God, and the the, the way that they. Uh, describe that he is the person who is living, he is the person who makes other people live, and giving this this uh, this aura about him that he is ever vigilant, he's always there. This is not a time when he is not attentive to you. So he is not sleeping for a single nanosecond uh, because he, if people are told that well, there is one small millisecond in which he is not aware or he's not available, that will be the time when people will make hay. So the Quran had to give this prescription that God, the sustainer person or the being who has brought you into existence and who sustains you, he is ever vigilant and there is no one who can intercede uh, for him or before him regarding other people. 
His knowledge is so complete that he knows what is in the past and he knows what is in the, in, in, in the future. And whatever people know is because of the knowledge that he has given them. He says that, لا يحيطون بشيئ من علمه إلا بماشرا That they only know of his knowledge what he himself would try to reveal or divulge. And such is his, his, uh, his knowledge that only he is able to divulge it and only then you are able to know about it. And his dominion spreads on the heavens and the earth. Wasya kursi, the word kursi or the, the chair as we know is uh, as a metaphor for uh, for expressing the fact that his dominion, his power, his sovereignty, he it prevails on the heavens and the earth and he protects them. And la yauduhu hifzuhuma, he does not get tired uh, while protecting them because you see to show vigilance for millions and billions of years and 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 continue with that vigilance forever and forever uh, it's, it's something that as human beings we just cannot imagine but here is god he's uh, he says about himself that he protects his dominion he's there he's controlling it and not a moment transpires when he is not vigilant about that dominion and that everything is under his control and that he does not get tired in any way in protecting it and uh, controlling it so with these uh, words, we come to an end to today's uh, uh, discussion. So we end on verse 255 here and the 10 minutes that remain, you have time to ask off-topic questions as well as any questions that might relate to this verse. Thank you, Dr. Salim. Nagar 20, please go ahead. Okay, Dr. Sir, my name is Abid. Uh, one off question from the lesson. Right. Uh, there is a group of people who consider that the Prophet Ibrahim asked mm -hmm. pray that the uh, the imamat should be in my progeny. Mm -hmm. So that's why they are saying the God has finished the Nabuwa, the end of the Nabuwa, and but the imamat uh, the, which is prayed for is carry on. So have uh, what's your uh, uh, what you say I about? I think it? this this verse has no, no bearing on the imamat of, for the group of people that we are talking of today. I mean, the imam uh, is not referring to any religious imam. It's referring to the imam amongst amongst the pro prophets of God as leaders. So the word imam is not referring to any religious leadership. It's actually referring to the overall, if I can use the word political leadership, that you are like leaders of mankind. So Abraham was um, appointed as the leader of mankind. And this uh, status was given to him at his request. I mean, not just his request. God said that because of the trials that you had gone through, we are now appointing you the leader of mankind. And when he said that, what about my followers? He said that, well, followers who would follow you would receive the same status. So, I mean, this is a very specific thing which the Quran is spoken of and it relates to uh, the progeny of Abraham. It does not relate to any sect of today or uh, yesterday or the times of the Prophet himself as people have, uh, have, have started to argue about. Uh, this imamah does not relate to any other imamat except the fact that uh, as rulers, as leaders of mankind, I mean, it's, just, it's, a, it's a leadership uh, position bestowed to the followers of Abraham and not just any religious leadership. So that's why they are believing that the the progeny Allah has given it and that's why the imamat is continued. That's why they are taking that bit from, from that sentence. So I'm just confused about it. I mean, but as I said, that, that, that sentence has no relation to today's, uh, uh, I mean, uh, people who call that, that they, they, are, they derive that imamat from that verse. Because as I said, that is something which was promised to Abraham's progeny. And, and it's like a collective leadership that was bestowed upon them, not the leadership of a single imam as they claim. Thank you very much, Dr. Sleem. Okay. Uh, Shabnam, please go ahead. Thank you, Maria. Sir, I have heard something from Ghamdi Sahib in which he told me about the Quran 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 कुछ statistics बताई थी अगर आपके know how में हो तो kind guide कर दें please नहीं actually the, uh, these statistics are just rough estimations what uh, he probably did say one was once was that two thirds of the Quran is revealed uh, for the people uh, for the idolaters and it was revealed uh, mostly in Mecca uh, because it was addressing the nation of the Prophet and it dealt with the polytheists so very a large part of the Quran deals with polytheism. 
And the rest of the Quran has a lot to say regarding people of the book. So whenever it deals with uh, the people who are in opposition to the message of God, so these are basically three entities or two entities. One are the people of the book and the other is are the idolaters. So the part of the Quran which relates to the idolaters is almost two thirds. And uh, mm -hmm. so it's not a, I mean, it's not an accurate statistic. All that it says is that basically people who are studying the Quran today, for them, mm -hmm. uh, it, I mean, because of the fact that we think that the Quran has everything in it, it's like a universal book of God. So the background for a person is that when he, when with this mindset, he approaches the Quran, he gets disappointed because he doesn't find universal things being mentioned there or so many other things that he might expect to have found there, find there. But the, what he actually finds there is a discussion either with the idolaters, which are the polytheists, or with the people of the book. So this was a, a misconception that he was trying to dispel that if you look at the Quran, that a major part of the Quran is either speaking to the idolaters, and when it speaks to the idolaters, of course, it would speak to them regarding their own beliefs. So if right. today people read it, it, they should read it in that historical perspective. Right, sir. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Sleem. Jawed Ishrat, did you still want to ask her a question? Mm, thank you very much. Uh, Jee, actually, the thing is that in 2000, years about after Ibrahim alayhi salam ke baad 2000 saal ya usse zada tak nabi aate rahe aur rasul bhi usme aaye to nabi sallallahu alaihi wasallam ko bhi almost itna hi arsa ho raha hai taqriban 1500 years ho rahe hain to iski wajah ye hai ke hamare paas jo kitab hai ya unki sunnat hai wo is qadar mehfooz tareeqe se hum tak aa chuki hai ke ab isme koi taghayyur nahi aa sakta isme koi cheez nayi add nahi ho sakti na isme se koi cheez nikali ja sakti hai to shayad is wajah se ab kisi nabi ki zarurat nahi hai aur zaruri nahi ki ye maaf kijiyega zaruri nahi ki yahi log islam ke leader rahe jaise gandhi sahab ne farmaya tha ki agar koi bhi qoum islam qabool kar leti hai aur koi tarakki yafta qoum islam qabool kar leti hai to islam ek quwwat dobara bhi hasil kar sakta hai और इस्लाम एक आलमगीर दावत है वो किसी एक قوم के लिए नहीं है इसमें कोई भी قوم इसमें आ सकती है एम आई राइट सर यस आपका सवाल क्या है नहीं सवाल इसमें ये गमदी साहब की जो बात थी जो इसमें ये हो सकता है ये जो इस बनी इस्माइल के बारे में खास तौर से कहा गया है ये बनी इस्माइली इसको लीड करेंगे क्या قیامت तक सिर्फ यही लीड करेंगे या कोई और قوم भी इसको दैट्स अ सेपरेट इशू you see, the, the promise with the uh, progeny of Abraham relates to their, uh, the promise uh, which, I mean, uh, uh, belongs to the people who are from his descendants. So not everyone is from his descendants today. And their own rise and fall will be governed by, by other principles of rise and fall. But this is a promise specifically made for the people of, uh, I mean, the progeny of Abraham. I mean, people who do not belong to the progeny of Abraham, for example, uh, and then, for example, people who are uh, not Semites, uh, they are Jephites or they are uh, Hamites, as we know, the, uh, the prophet Noah had uh, two more sons and they belong to his progeny. So they will follow that general law of rise and fall of nations. And that is a separate thing. And that is like a parallel thing which can exist. We are specifically talking about the Semites, uh, the Semitic race. And uh, so... Semitic race is the, is the race from which Abraham was born. And this promise was made to his race, uh, just his race. So there are other races besides him, uh, besides his race, which, which are equally there. And for them, the law is different. Thank you very much, Dr. Okay. Thank you very, Thank you very much. Thank you. Shiraz Ahmed, if you have a really quick question, go ahead. I promise you it's a quick one. <laughs> Thank you, sister. Assalamu alaikum, Shiraz Ahmed. So that way when uh, Quran said to Prophet Ibrahim, when God said to Prophet Ibrahim, Jai Luka Lin Nasi Imam, it was a leadership. Yes, that's what Imam means, but it was a religious leadership. My question is that Quran used it simply as an Arabic word. The word Imam, as per my understanding, has never been used as a divine position in the entire Quran, unlike the word prophets or messengers, mm -hmm. which are explained. Right. Chapter after chapter has divine position. So is it true that the word Correct. Imam Correct. has not been yeah. used as any divine position, but just as it's a simple not a divine position. Word. It's a it's a political and I mean just as you use a simple word in, in, in any language that you are the leader of mankind. 
So the word leader is used as the word imam. It's just a common Arab, uh, Arabic word. It doesn't have any specific connotation. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Salim. That was it for all the questions today. Inshallah, see you next week. And thank you so much for supplementing the our studies along with Bible studies. That is highly appreciated. And thanks to all the participants who showed up today and asked great questions. Inshallah, see you all next week. Assalamu alaikum.